This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 131, where today, AC and CJ are going to talk to Andrew Liu from Microsoft about some recent updates with Azure Document DB, recorded live May 24th, 2016. Welcome to the Microsoft Cloud Show, the only place to stay up to date on everything going on in the Microsoft Cloud world, including Windows Azure, Office 365, SharePoint, Exchange, Link, and related technologies. Just the information, no marketing, no BS. I'm Andrew Connell. And I'm Chris Johnson. And we're just two dudes telling you how we see it. The Microsoft Cloud Show is sponsored by Valid NL. Valid is a Microsoft Gold partner whose mission is to enable its customers to excel in their business through the innovative use of technology. Valid is always on the lookout for consultants, architects, and engineers. Do you know Azure, Business Intelligence and Analytics, .NET, Office 365, or SharePoint? Look them up on valid.nl. Hello, everybody. This is Andrew. So last week in episode 130, CJ sat down with Adam Hall from Microsoft and covered the show on his own as I was sitting on a beach in Mexico. Last week was a nice week-long relaxation vacation for myself and my wife, where we both have turned 40 years old this year, myself in February and uh, my wife in May, actually, while we were on our vacation. And we also celebrated our 15-year wedding anniversary. So we decided to pack up, leave the kids with the grandparents and my sister-in-law, and uh, headed to Mexico and didn't do anything but sit on the beach. It was a good day when you actually, we had one of us had actually taken a nap before 10 o'clock. My princess wife actually did that before 8.30 one day. Talk about slack, talk about relax, relaxing. And then other days, I think we even took like up to like three naps, all of them on the beach. So it was great. We had a fantastic time. We were in a very cool little town called uh, Zihuatanejo on the Pacific coast. It's in, nestled in a nice little bay. Highly recommend it. Definitely check it out if you're looking for something like that. Beautiful area. We had a great time, ate a lot of really good food. So anyway, this week, I'm manning the show myself, and I'm taking it, uh, repaying CJ's uh, generous uh, offer to take it over last week. Uh, And so I'm doing it solo this week. Uh, This week, I sat down with Microsoft's Andrew Liu, and we talked about a lot of the improvements to DocumentDB since we last talked back in um, October 2015 uh, in episode 99. So we talked about some of the, the wire level support for MongoDB that Document DB is added, which is really cool. It basically lets you work with the MongoDB client libraries, no matter what language you're using. But behind the scenes, you're actually using Document DB to store your data. So for those of you who do things with, like, say, SQL or SQL Server, think about it like this. You're using the SQL Server client libraries, and instead of using SQL Server on-prem or, like, installed in your environment, you're using Azure SQL Server instance. So it doesn't matter where the data is stored. It's still, as far as the client libraries know, it's just still SQL. Well, same thing works MongoDB now as I can use DocumentDB as my data store, but use the Mongo client libraries to talk to it. And so that's pretty cool. We also talked about some of the improvements that they had made around scale and performance, specifically around planet scale databases or global databases to speed up uh, applications that are scaled across the world. And then also how to do things like partition collections and the complications involved of dealing with partition collections, but then also how uh, the Azure team is doing this for you. We also talked about some of the recent changes to pricing. That was a big deal as far as, from my point of view, because that made, that made DocumentDB a lot more interesting to me. And uh, then finally, we also talked about some of the latest updates that were even announced just this month around retention policies for your data. So being able to set a TTL or a time to live on either a uh, DocumentDB collection or on uh, specific records so that they are automatically purged from the system when you actually create them. We'll get to that interview in just a minute, just a little recap here. You've heard CJ and I talk a little bit about the mailing list and listener survey that we've created. First, we've got over 200 subscribers now to the mailing list, so thank thank you very much to everybody who's signed up for that mailing list. For those of you who haven't, the people who are on it, we can definitely tell you that people have appreciated that we are not spamming them. We've actually had uh, very few, I don't actually think we've only had two people unsubscribe from it when we've sent a message out. We've got some uh, cool interviews scheduled coming up in the future. So we're, the, those of you who are on the mailing list will be getting an email from us soliciting some questions if you uh, have any questions about these things. So I know one's going to be around uh, Windows-based containers. Uh, we're going to interview someone right around the time of uh, uh, mid-June when uh, DockerCon is going on over in Seattle 
And um, we'll have a little bit more, hopefully some more news around Windows-based containers, which are in the latest version of uh, Windows Server, Windows Server 2016, I believe it's on Tech Preview 5. Another thing we have too is a listener survey. So if you've, um, we've got had over 80 responses to our listener survey. If you want to have your uh, input and your thoughts provided to us, just head over to the MicrosoftCloudShow.com. Look in the top navigation, you'll see listener survey. Click on that and just take about 30 seconds to fill out a form. You can just check all the boxes and give us just the demographics. Or if you take a few extra minutes and uh, write us a note, let us know, you know what you're interested in hearing more about. What do you want to see in the show? What do you not like? Uh, what would you like to hear us add? Those kinds of things would be really beneficial, really helpful for us. In a future so show, CJ and I are going to sit down and actually go over uh, a summary of the responses that we've received from people to share with you kind of what other people are saying and uh, also some of the changes and things that we want to do to the show based on what the, the feedback is that we've heard from people. So for those two things, to sign up for the mailing list, if you just go to our website, microsoftcloudshow.com, you'll see a little widget pop up in the bottom right-hand corner, and you just go provide your email address, and you'll be added to the newsletter. We've had, like I said, very few people, I think only two people have unsubscribed from it, so rest assured, we will not sell your email addresses, we will not give them to our sponsors, we will not give them out to anyone, it's a email service that we don't manage. So if you want to unsubscribe, it's a one-click, very easy unsubscribe process that whenever you want to, whenever you're done with it, so you don't have to worry about actually getting off of our list. Another thing too that I want to uh, introduce is a new segment that CJ and I have decided to add to the show. It's called the Know Your Microsoft Cloud. So it's a, a, all about tips and tricks on Office 365 and Azure or highlighting little bits and pieces of the Microsoft Cloud that you may not be aware of. So to this week, the one that I wanted to focus on is something called Azure SQL Database Recommendations. So what you can do is that Azure, Azure SQL Databases, they will watch the activity on your database that you have up in the cloud. And if it sees something that, you, that would benefit your database, like a new index, it will suggest that. It'll suggest that, hey, here's an index that we want to create on, your, on this one table for these specific columns. We think that it'll definitely help your the speed and performance of your database based on the queries that we've seen the database receive and the performance that it's, that it's been incurring. I recently uh, went and checked this out on the database that I use to manage my Orchard multi-tenant instance that I have up in, in Azure that runs both the podcast website and my blog and a couple other sites. And it recommended a new collection, or sorry, an index to be created on one table. So I went ahead and said, yeah, go ahead and create the index, can't hurt anything. It queues the operation up, and a day or so later, the index was created on the database. I went back and looked at the performance uh, history of the database, and sure enough, I saw the performance actually increase, or the, the load on the database actually decreased a little bit after it had created that index. So it definitely had a positive impact. This is something that you can review. You can choose to implement these indexes. It just makes the recommendations. If you want, uh, one of the new things they've added is the ability to automatically have these things applied to your database for you. So I was so happy with the way I got it, uh, with the performance I had, that I just said, go ahead, do it again. Do it in the future. So anytime it sees an index that would benefit my database, then it goes ahead and automatically applies it. That's all generally available. You just go to um, the portal.azure.com, log into your Azure subscription, go find your Azure SQL database, and on the settings blade for the database, you'll see a section called performance. And one of the items under there is called recommendations. So click on that and you can see what's going on. You can even see a list of all the queries under the same performance section. There's a queries option. And you can see a list of all the, your top queries and most expensive queries that are going on. So you can see, you know, where is your database taking the biggest hits? I know as a developer doing this on-prem with a local SQL Server instance, you know, we could always profile our database and we could always run it through the profiler and analyzer and go optimize our queries that way. But this way, there's really nothing for me to really do it. Azure's doing it for me automatically. It's fantastic. I think it's something you do have to opt into, but it's very, very beneficial. Uh, they do have in preview mode as well to where it will automatically drop indexes for you as well if it doesn't think that they're needed. So that's our first installment in the new segment of Know Your Microsoft Cloud. All right, so why don't we go ahead and jump over to the interview Again, talk to Microsoft's Andrew Liu on document DB improvements around performance and scale and new features and support for the MongoDB wire level protocol. 
that have happened with DocumentDB in the six or seven months since we last spoke to him in episode 99 back in October of 2015. Okay, I am here today with Andrew Liu from Microsoft to talk a little bit about the document DB. So, Andrew, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. It's it's been a little while, I guess. What six, seven months since we last talked? Yeah, last time we talked, uh, this is episode 131. Last we spoke was episode 99, and that was back in October of 2015. So uh, I know you guys have been quite busy, and you've gotten a lot of updates with Document DB, and we've gotten a lot of questions about it that. Especially right when we had the episode come out, a lot there was a lot of interest, and then since then, we had some people that have asked uh, to actually have you back because you've been so we've been so busy and they enjoyed the episode. So here we are. We're going to talk about some of the cool new stuff that you guys have done. So happy to chat, man. <laughs> awesome. So there's, I mean, I know you guys have been busy with a lot of different things. We're not going to we don't run through every single little bit here and kind of talk us more on the. The, um, the focus stuff or the, the things that are, I know are a little more kind of engineering or developer focused. and But just real briefly, I know since we last talked in 2015, you guys had news about uh, how DocumentDB now support, or it's, I guess it's old news now, but it supports paging using like the top and link operators. And you went GA in a bunch of different Azure regions. So I know you're now supported in, in Japan East, Japan West, Central US, North Central US, South Central US, East US, East US 2, West US, Southeast Asia, North Europe, West Europe. That was a list of everything that at least was in my subscription today. And I know that, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was even more stuff showing up recently, but you guys seem to be everywhere. And you also had, uh, earlier this year, had some uh, announcements about how you are uh, now certified uh, for ISO 27001 HIPAA and the European Union model clauses. So you're in everywhere and also have a ton, ton of different certifications here. So you guys are in really good shape and a really good data option for a lot of people building components these days. So earlier this year, starting, I guess, around March in the last two months, you guys have had a, a handful of announcements that I wanted to pick your brain on and kind of get some, uh, some information on part. It's definitely stuff that I'm interested in. I know our listeners are as well. One of the big ones that kind of seemed like it came like, at least from my point of view, it came out of left field, but this is an awesome idea, was you added protocol support for MongoDB. So I know MongoDB is a very popular NoSQL option, um, especially in the non-Microsoft development world for, like, say, Node.js, Node Node.js, and a couple other platforms. But um, why don't you explain a little bit about what this means for people or what exactly you guys did with this? Oh, sure. Okay. So, I mean, the high-level goal behind this project was we think MongoDB is an awesome database that uh, we, we, we really love. Like if we had it, if I had to choose our favorite competitors, it's, it's definitely them. A lot of it was they have quite a bit of mind share. And what we want to do was we wanted to build a database also that's easy to use. So some of the goals behind DocumentDB early on was we wanted to make, you know, this database very easy to, to learn, to pick up, and just get started using, right? So this is why we made a, a huge commitment to JSON to trying to do a, a SQL-like query grammar. But in the spirit of this, what we wanted to also do is, you know, continue to meet developers where they are. And because, I mean, MongoDB has got such great mindshare, why don't we also embrace them as, you know, somewhat almost a, almost like a standard and, and really open up you know, our doors to, to that ecosystem? And so what we did was uh, we introduced wire level protocol support for MongoDB. And what this means is the document DB, like on, on server side, uh, understands the, the wire level protocol that the MongoDB cr- uh, client driver uses to communicate. And what's special about this approach is that means it's agnostic to which platform you're running on. We didn't just copy the API uh, or you know method signatures of the driver itself and made a whole new SDK that's only open for one, pl- one platform. Instead, you can connect you know theoretically with any MongoDB driver, whether that's Node.js, Python, Java, Ruby, uh, you name it. Some caveats to know about this: the big ones are, I mean, DocumentDB and MongoDB overall have they don't have the, the feature sets don't exactly mirror each other. And what we're doing behind the scenes is 
We're enabling DocumentDB to understand requests from the MongoDB driver, but you have to understand also that what we're doing is we're translating this and, and matching this to DocumentDB's capabilities. So anywhere you see an intersection of what DocumentDB supports and what MongoDB supports, that is what you can use with the protocol support with MongoDB. There are some features today that only exist on in MongoDB and not in DocumentDB. And so a request using those features, well, we have nothing really to translate to, so therefore they won't work. What kinds of things are those? Would you, do you have any, like off the top of your head, that some things that you say that if somebody is familiar with, with Mongo, just to let them know that say, you know, this is something that we don't do just because it's just, it's a different environment. Oh, sure. The really, really short summary that probably doesn't do the effort justice, but the, the short uh, just is what I can do is, you know, any basic CRUD, any query, you can expect, you know, CRUD and query operations like core database func functionality all to work. But it's all those small side features like GridFS or the aggregation pipeline and the MapReduce Hadoop connector for MongoDB. But MongoDB also supports their own MapReduce uh, functionality. Those are things that we don't have anything to map to. So mm -hmm. uh, don't expect, like, you know, GridFS functionality or aggregation pipeline to, to work. Okay. But, I mean, all core CRUD and query operations, those are, you know, those you can definitely expect to work. Okay, cool. So it, one of the things, that, one of the scenarios that I thought that was was really interesting that this enabled was, at least I've been doing it a lot lately, but we've also been hearing from a lot of listeners that people are, developers are starting to really adopt this whole idea of like container-based development a lot more. And building an application, let's just say you're using Docker, you're building an application that's a series of multiple containers and um, you've got the, the core bit of your application, which is just different services that you built. But say you've got one service that's going to be that you're using that's going to be all of your, your data store. And you have another one for message queuing and one for caching. You know, one of the nice things about caching we can do today is that I can have a, a setup for building my entire application on my laptop, all completely disconnected, or well, as disconnected as you can be once it's up and running. But I have a container that's going to be hosting Redis, but my entire application will be working with Redis. But when I decide to go to production, I don't want to maintain my own Redis instance. Instead, I'd rather pay a service to do that like Azure. And so in my production or my staging instance, I don't have Redis alive. I don't have a Redis image there. Instead, I'm actually just pointing the connection string to my hosted Redis that Azure provides or whatever cloud provides. I see this as one of the neat things too about with uh, as far as a, a data option to where I can have locally on my local dev instance, I can have a, a container that's got Mongo up and running. And then when I want to move this to like staging or my integration testing or production, that configuration, that deployment doesn't have a Mongo instance. Instead, I'm using document DB and I just change the connection string to point to essentially the document DB, but the rest of my application doesn't really know any of the difference. I'm still just working with the data. I'm just working with the same the same drivers, the same, the same protocol, but on the back end, the data is not stored in a container. Instead, it's stored up in Azure in a service that's backed up, maintained, and run by you guys in scale. So this is something, I mean, is that a fair way to also look at this as an option here, as, a, as something that it enables developers to take advantage of? Oh, absolutely. And yeah, like you, you, you kind of uh, nailed it there. Like the only difference to take advantage, or the only thing developers have to do to take advantage of this feature is changing a, a connection string, and then everything else should work. And I mean, some of the things that I think DocumentDB really brings to the table is the managed aspect. It's a managed service that provides SLAs, and this becomes really important when you're looking at at scale usage. So, I mean, when you're thinking about Dockerizing your application, normally you wouldn't couple all of this into a single container mm -hmm. if this was something that you need like at scale. When you need to deploy across many, many different instances, what ends up happening is you're going to decouple you know, your data uh, storage with your application, with your cache, and all of these different services. One of the big core problems around data is the manageability of it, is when you're looking at managing, let's say, uh, you know, you have such high throughput and storage requirements that it doesn't fit on a single VM. It doesn't fit on a, a single box anymore. Well, you, you now have this pattern of scaling out, right? And this is really what NoSQL's whole 
the, the whole strong point of uh, NoSQL is, is what if we were to rethink about building a database with scale out in mind from the very beginning? Mm. And this is what the whole schema agnostic database approach is is all about. Schema never goes away. Your application always is well aware of schema. Otherwise, you know, what do you query off of? <laughs> right. I think there is a bit of a misconception that people think, you know, you know, uh, the database is schemaless, so I don't have to think about schema anymore. Data modeling is actually still very important mm. for NoSQL databases. But coming back to my point is managing that schema across many, many different databases. Let's say I'm, I'm sharding my database across 100 nodes. Managing indexes and, and schema is, is non-trivial work. Yeah. And so a lot of our recent development efforts have been focused on making at scale usage, you know, at scale data really, really easy to, you know, it's an easy problem that will solve for you. But yeah, coming back to this, I mean, if you didn't want to manage, let's say, large clusters of, of VMs and, and you wanted to be able to have SLAs around this where uh, you want us to be on call for uptime rather than you being on call and page when something happens to your database, we'll take care of that. And furthermore, when updates happen, I mean, we'll, we'll handle all of the deployments. Like you're never really there going, oh, crap, another security update has popped up for my database or for the underlying OS, and now I'm spending all day patching software. You don't have to do that. Imagine a world where just how much you can get done when you don't have to just patch software and, and babysit servers all day. Well, yeah, it really, and it, I love this model. I mean, it's one of the biggest appeals of this whole like Docker-based Based development or deployment development and model is for me for building applications is that you know, you can really focus on just the processing side of your application and take all of the everything we have to store data and really hand that off to people who are, who have the not only the infrastructure and the support but also the ability to scale it really well. I mean, for not only just data at rest, like it's something at document DB or let's just even say if it was SQL, but also for things like say queuing or for any kind of messaging that you want to do with like say Service Bus or RabbitMQ. Same thing with caching. I mean, it's like it's stuff that, as a developer, I don't want to deal with it as, as being able to have a small dev team that doesn't have to have a DBA on staff. I mean, I know classic data modeling stuff, but I don't have to have somebody who knows how to really fine tune and optimize, do all this stuff to, to be able to maintain an application and worry about the security side of it. I mean, it really does. It reduces my cost and reduces my burden. It lets me get to market a lot faster. So one of the things you, you kind of touched on there about being able to sharding the database, you know, one of the things that another thing that you guys announced recently was around partition collections. So can you talk a little bit about what is a you know partition collection? How does that allow you to do like, you know, things like for when you have like higher storage or higher throughput needs for an application? How does document DB help help you here? Oh, absolutely. So I mean when you're dealing with problems at scale, this normally comes in two forms, right? Either I have a, a lot of storage, I need a lot of storage, I'm just de- share, uh, storing a, a sheer, you know, quantity am- uh, amount of data. And the other is really like that, that gets, it's the problem around the three Vs and this is volume. The other big V that touches on scale is velocity, which is, you know, you're drinking from a fire hose. You you have such high throughput requirements that I have more I need more IOPS than a single box can handle. And so as you scale your application, you have really two ways of thinking about this problem. One is you can scale up or you can scale out. Scaling up means, uh, you know, I'll buy a a bigger box, a a box with uh, more CPU, more RAM, more I.O., and I will buy the biggest, baddest box out there. The problem is that you have a very real limit, which is, well, what is the biggest, baddest box out there? And once you hit that limit, you hit a a hard wall, and you cannot scale up any further. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're now just kind of waiting until someone builds better hardware. The other way you can think about this problem is scaling out, which is, well, I know that I have more CPU, RAM, and I/O requirements than a single box can ha- uh, can hold. But what if I had two boxes? What if I had three boxes? What if I had a thousand boxes, right? And I really scale out. And so what you're doing here is you're partitioning that data across many, many different nodes and leveraging the fact that you can now just scale out uh, across, you know, just a, a lot of physical hardware. Now, this comes with a lot of challenges. I think the the gist of it is sharding is hard, but the two big problems behind it, one is routing your requests. So now that I have my data across many different nodes, when I now need to serve, let's say, a query or a CRUD operation, like a request comes in, I now need to be able to route and tell it which partition, which box it needs to hit. Otherwise, if you, in the absence of knowing which node or, or which uh, box you need to hit, what ends up happening is you all, you have to fan out. And 
then you end up going, well, the whole point of me doing this exercise is to to be able to scale to, let's say, handle a massive amount of uh, re requests or store massive amounts of data. If I found out every request, I, I really kind of am putting a multiplier on how expensive each request is, hmm. and that's not a, an effective way of, of scaling. So what you need to do is you need to be able to route. The other big problem is um, uh, managing that data which is today I have uh, 100 partitions and tomorrow I have 101 partitions. The problem in this space is, well, let's say I wanted to load balance all of my data across the, uh, my first initial set of 100 partitions. What I might have to do is I do, I'll do a hash partitioning scheme where I'll take some kind of uh, uh, a value, let's say the ID or you know geography, something that I want to partition on, and then I'm going to hash that value and then mod that by the number of partitions and spread that data out across all of these partitions. That way, when requests come in, I am now uh, very nicely balancing those requests across these partitions. The problem with this is uh, tomorrow I find that I have hit you know, the limits of my existing set of partitions. And so the way I scale up further is I add more partitions. So I, let's say I go from 100 partitions to 101 or to you know, even 200. That means that I'm going to have to rebalance all of that data, not from 100 partitions, but to 200 partitions, right? So if I take that hash and uh, divide it, now, now mod it to the new set, I have to now basically rebalance and move all this data. Hmm. Otherwise, requests will be uh, routed to the, to the wrong node. All of this is a huge, painful problem to solve. Mm -hmm. And the whole goal around partition collection is, you know what? You don't have to think about the world this way. We're like... The end goal here is you know how much throughput and how many requests per second, let's say, you want or how much storage you want. Instead of thinking about, you know, doing all this partition math and figuring out how you do management of this, we'll handle it for you. So uh, what a partition does is, uh, a partition collection does is you set a partition key, and this is uh, telling the database how you want to spread that data, and then you're just given a simple slider for a throughput. You can dial this up, you can dial this down, and we'll handle all of the, the partition magic behind the scenes, and uh, this becomes you know really low effort. And I think this is really beautiful because I guess I just kind of described all of the work involved with doing this you know data <laughs> management. And, and, and like there's there's actually a few more problems around doing this whole capacity planning. The other one is you're not even aware sometimes of. I have a target request per second, but really, like, what is the bottleneck? Is it memory? Is it throughput? I mean, sorry, is it memory? Is it CPU? Is it I.O.? And what you normally do is, well, I don't know what the, the, the problem is, so maybe I'll, I'll stress the system. Hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll do a bunch of load testing. I'll see that, okay, the bottleneck is memory. But then you're going, well, if I have 100 requests per second supported now and I'm going to go to 1,000, what do I, how much memory do I actually add, right? Oh, that, that, that's uh, a bit mysterious. So what you do is you throw some memory at this problem, and then uh, you'll load test it again and see if you actually hit your number. And if you didn't, you, know, you just repeat this process, and it's quite tedious. One of the other things that I, I think DocumentDB, and as well as uh, a lot of the other Azure services makes really convenient, is we do a logical abstraction over all of the physical resources required to uh, perform a request. So instead of thinking about you know how much CPU, how much memory, how much I.O., we just give you one value. It's a logical value called request units. I think our brothers in SQL might call this uh, DTUs, mm -hmm. but somewhat similar concept. And when you uh, fire off a request, we'll tell you in the response how many request units it takes. So if I know that this request takes two request units and I need to perform 100 of these per second, I multiply two by 100 and I go, okay, great, I need 200 request units uh, per second provisioned. Now what the slider and partition collections is, you're provisioning throughput represented in the amount of request units per second you need. Mm. So. If you know that I need a million request units per second, great. All you do is you dial that slider up to a million request units per second, and you're all good. Hmm. It makes this super easy. It sounds like a lot like how, uh, uh, like, with scaling up with like the Azure websites goes. I mean, where or web apps where I can tell that my site is under load. I can look at the I can look at the CPU. I can look at the memory kind of thresholds and stuff. But and I know that you know maybe I need one, maybe I need two. But it's nice to be able to kind of say that, you know, you don't, you can, certain things you can definitely anticipate what, where those different scale hit issues hit. But 
I, I don't want to have to be the one to kind of babysit it all the time and say, you know, how do I have to go through and scale up when I need to scale up? And what does that mean? How do I change the data? How do, or how do I change my application code to be able to figure out where these requests are supposed to go between the different hosts? And so, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of, you know, that's something that can be automated. It's something that a, a cloud service can automate for us and really simplifies it for the developer. So again, it's something that we don't really have to think about too much. We'd rather just take advantage of the fact and say, I can figure out how expensive my app is. And then by doing a standard load test, running through everything, taking a list of all the different, the sum of all the different request units that, that I'm creating there. And I can, of course, even look at the queries and try and optimize stuff. And it's kind of a tangent, but I've seen some really cool blog posts where people have taken queries and they just show if you just change one or two little things here, you can go from like, say, you know, seven or eight request units all the way down to like, you know, one or two, just getting the same data back, but just getting it in a different way and how it puts less of a, a burden on, on the system. But then just instead of, you know, if I, if I need these, you know, how do I know, you know, what am I looking for? How do I buy this stuff? How do I, how do I actually scale up? So having, having the ability to do this with document DB and just saying, you guys figure out how this partition is going to happen for me. I remember I've done that in one project or multiple projects in the past. And it was just, like you said, it's figuring out how you're going to partition it. It's quite an exercise to go through to get it done the first time, but it's always terrifying as you're about to roll it out, just going, well, I need to go through and add a little bit more to make sure I have that extra room because once I hit that threshold, this is going to be just as painful, if not more painful, to do this again to go up on the other side. So if it's something that you guys can take care of for us, oh, we'd love to take have to take advantage of that. Something to also, I think that's really cool about this is not only can you scale up, but you can also scale it down. So as you're doing this, you know, capacity planning and thinking about, you know, how much, let's say, throughput will I need. And you're not just buying, let's say, VMs or hardware for peak usage, right? Mm-hmm. Because this is a cloud service, it's, it's and it's a managed, you know, platform as a service. You can also dial this down so that if I have traffic that spikes in the day and really gets quiet at night, I actually can dial this throughput up and down. And this leads to tremendous cost savings because you're now no longer having to accommodate for whatever your peak is and leaving that on forever. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, that's I, I've been able to take advantage of that too. I haven't done that with Document DB. Once I saw you guys added this, this was a real this is really appealing. But I've done that on the website side where you know you know I know that the site's going to get hit, I, and I haven't even figured out what it is. But one of the sites I run, we get nailed every three days between on East Coast time between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. And before we were just, I had it set up to where I'd either let the site just get hammered during that time, it was no big deal, or I went in, if I saw it happening, then I would manually go scale it up and just say, add three more instances to it and let it deal with it. Now, you know, it's nice to be able to say auto scale, just say, you guys scale up for me and then scale it back down when when I need to come back down from there. Do you see this as something that's gonna come to Document DB where you guys will handle the scale force, where it can say, here's an upper threshold that I want to be able to get to, but you know, when I'm only going to be using, if I'm only going to be like, say, at, you know, 200 DTUs, or sorry, 200 request units per second for this amount of time, and then maybe at a certain time of the month, it needs to spike up to say 200, 10 times that, or 100 times that. Is this something that I could actually set up a, like an upper limit, a lower limit, and then let you guys kind of scale me kind of back and forth in there to get the same kind of performance that I'm looking for? Oh, uh, yeah. So this is something that I think we'll eventually get to. We aren't there just yet. Mm-hmm. But that said, until this it becomes closer on the horizon, I don't really have any dates around this. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. But, I mean, I, I do think this is something that long-term we will we will definitely light up. You're moving in the direction to where that's going to become more of an option now and to see where that's going. You see other Azure services providing I me. Mean, it, it, I mean, from the outside, it looks logical that that's another place yeah. that you guys would go. So at least we're moving in that direction. It's really nice. I mean, it's, it's nice to know. Like, last week I was on vacation, and I just... I pulled my phone up at one point. I told myself I'd never check my email. I finally did it you know, halfway through. <laughs> but it was really cool to just see that it was, without doing anything, I saw three instances where Azure spiked up the number of instances. It only did it for about 20 or 30 minutes at a time. It went from two instances up to six instances, and then it dropped right back down to, to two instances. And so you don't end up paying for all that time, but the site still runs great and flawless and the speed that the users see is still nice and peppy, but you'd rather throw money at it sometimes not to worry about dealing with the whole re-architecture. Oh, yeah. What's kind of cool about 
where we've gotten to today so far, I mean, we've solved basically the hard problems, which is the uh, data movement already. And we, we've exposed a slider. There really is nothing stopping you from writing a thin wrapper over this to automatically scale this up and down. I think, so our billing model is we bill hourly. If you know which hours of the day that you need higher throughput, you can just scale up. Uh, and and which, which hours are quiet, just scale down. Like you, you could totally, it wouldn't involve that much effort to actually build this. So all of that, what that slider provides, that's all provided through the REST API, the Azure REST API. So it's something that I could have on my side to where if I anticipate a certain load coming, like if I'm selling tickets to a concert and I know something's going on sale, I can actually open that up for the next four hours when the concert's about to go on sale. So I know that we get a lot of requests coming in and then scale it back down. But I can set that up on my side without having to wait for you guys to provide something like that. So a collection has this concept of an offer type. And within that offer type, you can set the either the amount of throughput or a uh, performance level. So in our old model, what we had was uh, we had the concept of an S1, an S2, and an S3. And what an S1, S2, and S3 performance level give you, gives you is uh, just a, a different amount of throughput, where the S1 gives you 250 request units per second, the S2 gives you 1,000 request units per second, and the S3 gives you 2,500 request units per second. But they also come with uh, 10 gigabytes of storage. And the artifact of this is you now have three hard click stops for throughput coupled, tightly coupled with 10 gigabytes of storage. Uh, what we've done is we've recently introduced a new pricing model where we've decoupled storage and throughput so that storage is charged completely on a consumption model, which is 25 cents per gigabyte. And throughput is uh, charged uh, in a provision model, uh, which gives us the ability to know, you know how many requests you want to throw at us before we throttle you. And this is done in 100 request unit per second chunks, uh, which cost $6 per chunk. In the context of auto scaling, what you can do is uh, you can programmatically set an offer type with different request units. So in the new model, rather than choosing S1, S2, S3, you just tell us how much throughput you, you want and we'll just handle it. You can say, you know, at, right now I want, let's say, 10,000 request units per second. And if I do an update on this collection, if I perform the operation, what's, what's, what it'll do is it'll tell document DB, okay, set the amount of throughput to 10,000 request units per second. In a couple hours when traffic dies down, I want to lower that, I can just lower that value, uh, call replace on the collection with the, the new offer type, and that'll dial it down. So you can programmatically dial up and down using either our REST API or any of our SDKs also support this. So, I mean, our .NET SDK, Java, Python, Node. And really, personally, I think it's a lot easier to interact with our SDKs and our REST API. But yeah, you can do that programmatically. That's awesome. That was I know when I first saw the pricing model come out, it was that was one of the things that I kind of looked at and kind of was like, ah, shoot, you know. So I gotta, I, I have to pick these, you know, these big chunks of how much data I'm going to use. And even though if I'm not using as much as I really need, if or as much as that that one plan offers, I know I'm just barely into that from the previous model. So having that ability to just go based on consumption and then having that split separately um, based on the amount of like the amount of work that I'm doing, the amount of through Put I have. That's nice because then you, you're enabling a much more flexible model to support people who may have really large stores that are not, don't have as much transactions going on them. But you also have the other side, which may have smaller stores, but are highly transactional, have a lot of different work going on them. And so this pricing model does really support both of those options. And it doesn't, you're not really kind of pushing everybody into the same model. And it gives you so many more click stops too in between. So instead of having, you know, three throughput levels, you have many, many different click stops where you can just dial, like if you wanted 1,200 or 1,300 uh, request units per second, you can do that. Ah, that's cool. That's very cool. Um, so I, another thing that I saw you guys talk about or recently talk about was um, going back to our scale discussion was about um, global databases. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you guys have done with around the like planet scale of global databases? Oh, uh, yeah. So global databases, a way to think about this is active geo replication. And what we'll do is we'll actively uh, replicate your data across uh, any of the other regions we have which is awesome if you think about it in terms of your application. If I have an application that has a global presence, let's say I have users 
and North America and Europe and Asia. And the thing is, like, if I have all of my data, let's say, in a database located in North America, the latency for those requests from my, for my European users, for my Asia user, users, is going to be really, really high. Basically, I'm now dealing with this huge bottleneck, which is the speed of light and how fast I can move an electron over a wire, right? So the way you increase performance for your application, uh, which translates to decreasing the latency for these requests, is, well, you move that data closer to that user, right? That way you don't have to propagate that data over such a long distance. So what we'll do is we'll actively uh, replicate data to, to a set of secondary regions of your choosing, and we expose those as uh, read-only secondary regions. What's cool about this is, I mean, this really also helps with uh, really two scenarios. Uh, one is disaster recovery and the other is high availability. And high availability is like kind of what I just described. And your data is now available to users globally and you can now uh, serve that with very, very low latency. But from a disaster recovery standpoint, what's also interesting about this is, let's say if uh, zombies took over my primary uh, write region, what I can do is I can uh, automatically fail over to any, any of these other regions that I've been ap actively replicating to, and I can promote one of those to be my new write region. And that way, if, if a data center were to experience an outage, it does get overrun by zombies, you don't have to panic. There's no downtime for us restoring your data into a, another region and manually. This has already been actively replicated over and it'll seamlessly, your application will just continue to work. So you have one level of panic with the zombies, but you don't have to worry about it so much with your data. Right. I got you. Okay. <laughs> it was the first time I think we've had the, a zombie attack uh, come into the show, but that's, <laughs> that's pretty cool, though. So, I mean, so you would, you set up one of your regions then is like the right, and then it replicates everything else. It repli replicates out to one or more of the different data centers, but as reads, and then your application can be smart enough to, to pull back from the pull from those, the, the do reads from the local data center to make a much better experience for your end users. So what's cool is you don't even have to do any deployments or do anything manually on, on your side as a developer. What we do is we give you a single endpoint that the SDK is aware of. And through the SDK, you can also set a list of preferred regions. And uh, what the SDK will then do is it'll use that set of preferred regions to serve reads, as well as when you want to do failover on the portal side, you can you can give us a, a list of preferred regions to failover on, and that'll automatically failover. And the that'll get communicated to your the, the client as the client makes requests, and the, the client will then just automatically pick that up. And you don't have to change endpoints or anything on the application side. So failover is really... It's really effortless and that uh, you don't have to do anything. We'll, we'll just take care of it. That's really cool. The One more thing, one more question I had for you, too, uh, about an, an update that actually it seems like you guys announced this just recently deals with like expiring old data. So I know that, you know, one of the one of the challenges that we have with our applications is that you over time, you accumulate a lot of crop, you accumulate a lot of data in your application. And, you know, a lot, most things, of course, you're going to have to keep around, you have to store, it's all very important stuff. But there's also a certain amount of data that you really don't need to keep around as long. So maybe it's, I know logs are probably a bad example. They're an easy example to understand, but they're probably a bad example of what you'd want to store and say document DB, because there's other places to, to store log data. But uh, if you're storing like you know historical transactions, I saw you guys had an update about it, how you can automatically expire data out of a document DB to where it's not something that the application has to deal with, but it's something that I can tag with as I write data to document DB and let document DB expire that stuff for me. Is that is that something you can talk a little bit about and explain to our, our listeners what that is? Oh, sure. So we call this feature time to live. And what you can do is you can uh, set a kind of a retention policy, which is a, an epoch value of how long you want to retain data, whether that's 30 days, a year, whatever, whatever you'd like. And you can set this as uh, either as a default on a collection level, which is then overridable on a individual record level, or you can not specify a, a default and just do it on a record level. And what's kind of cool is if you get this wrong and you need to go, oh, 
crap, like I really don't want to, to delete and prune this data, what you can actually do is toggle on a collection level also whether you can turn this feature on and off. And if you turn it off, what will happen is the database goes, oh, okay, you, you've decided that you no longer want to prune this data, so we won't look at that TTL attribute on that document. And the way you leverage this is you just put a TTL uh, property in your document similar to the ID property. It's just lowercase TTL and an epoch value. And basically the way this works is we also uh, we also have this timestamp, right? This underscore TS system property, which is an epoch value of when this record was last written, whether that's the create or a last update. If you were to add that epoch value, the TTL and the timestamp that I last touched this record, if the current time is greater than that, what we'll do is we'll prune that data out. And it's funny that you bring logging up as a scenario. This actually is one of the core scenarios for this feature. And I'd say both a mix of logging as well as IoT. What we've seen on our end is one of the, the big common scenarios for uh, using NoSQL and is IoT. It's it's doing telemetry from sensors, right? You're, you're, what you're doing is you're emitting a bunch of sensor data over periods, you know, intervals of time to a data store. And what's beautiful about doing this in Document DB is, as you can imagine, as you iterate, the thing about doing devices uh, that's different about software is when I want to update software, I just patch some software and it's good. But for hardware, that's a bit harder. And over time, what happens is you'll find that your sensors emit different attributes as you uh, add uh, you maybe new radios, you might add uh, you know just different sensors even on the device itself. And so the attributes start to vary over time. And what's really cool about storing this kind of data in document DB, is as you ingest it, you can just query over that. We have also automatic indexing, so you can query over any of these sensor attributes you have. And you don't have to manage any you know, schemas or indexes on that. The thing about IoT, same with uh, logging, is over time this is you know quite a bit of data that you're you're storing, and you may not always want to retain all of this data, right? Like let's say you want to save on some costs by pruning this out periodically. Well, the old way of doing this is you might do a scheduled job, and let's say every month you'll kick off this scheduled job and it'll do a, a batch delete, delete everything that's older than a certain date. Well, rather than having to do th this really manual process of pruning data, you just set a TTL attribute and you can say, well, I only want to retain sensor data for 60 days and after that I want it to be pruned. Well, you can now do that as just a one-step process. You just add an attribute and the database will take care of it for you. That's pretty cool then. So it, I understand the scenario for definitely for logging and definitely for IoT. It makes it does make a lot of sense. I mean, I, I, when I, the comment I made about logging, I guess, is more I see there's a bunch of services that will take logs for you, like uh, Elasticsearch. Those things can take those things and you can set up, you know, how long do you want to keep stuff along around? But the IoT one, I mean, is logging from sensors. That's, that's a little bit different. I mean, that does make a lot of sense where you say you have different types of data that are coming in. Things are going to change over time as, the, as you upgrade your, your devices or, or things even just expire and just kind of get replaced and stuff. But that's really cool to be able to do that. Is there any kind of a, any kind of an event that gets fired so that before data is actually expired that, that you can actually have something that maybe you wanted to preserve that in another place or maybe you wanted to have like a, a dump of that data go to like say a, a blob store or like to a table store or something like that? We don't have that in place today just yet, but that is, a, I think, a very interesting concept. And I can definitely see uses for that, for, uh, especially when you want to do uh, really embrace like a reactive programming model. That is an idea that we're flirting with. Oh, okay, so stay tuned. You may may see may see some uh, some other stuff around that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely stay tuned. I mean, it's not something that we're actively building right now, so I wouldn't expect in the near term future, but. This is something that really excites us and interests us. So the thing about cloud services is we, we also get to move fairly quickly where we can just deploy updates to our service on a, on a fairly regular cadence with short intervals. That I mean, you might see this further down the road. Uh, so definitely stay tuned. Well, very cool. Is there, a, I know we've, we've taken up a lot of your time here today. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us a lot about Document DB. Is there anything that you, uh, that you wanted to, to throw out that I might have missed or uh, that you wanted to uh, mention to our listeners? Or I think we've adequately, co we've adequately covered everything. You can tell like that this was a lot of updates to have in the last six or seven months. And this can be sometimes uh, hard to keep up with. If you are interested in keeping up with, uh, I, I think... I, the best ways of keeping tabs on us is 
Uh, we have an Azure blog that you can see updates across all services. Or if you really only care about a subset of services, each service also maintains an RSS feed with service updates. So I think that's also worth taking a look at. The other way of keeping up to date with us is through Twitter. We do like to engage our user base uh, over Twitter. And so uh, please like follow us, uh, tweet us. Our account is at DocumentDB. And yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely second. I mean, you guys are, are, well, across all Azure services are like, are, are like this as well. But I mean, you guys do a really good job of keeping everybody up to date on changes that are happening and updates. And frankly, even working on this episode as well, is it's really easy to see the changes that you guys have had since the last time we talked because using just the, the filter for just updates coming from document DB. Yeah, it's it's really easy to keep in to keep in touch with everybody. And to, to all of our listeners, I can definitely tell you that, you know, this is an area that is uh, very interesting to me. So, you, you know, when you've you've heard us talk about some of these announcements, I've I've mentioned on on as news bits on the show, but we haven't really spent too much time going too deep into them. I wanted to make sure we uh, had pulled a couple of them together and got Andrew back on the show to to talk through some of this stuff. So definitely keep listening to the show. Will, anything new that they that they come out with, any big any big updates and stuff, we will definitely highlight them. And hopefully if at the cadence you guys are going on, and we have to maybe shorten the time that we, that we uh, between the two times that we talk to you, uh, Andrew, because it's, <laughs> you have so much stuff come out so, so frequently, it just could definitely fill up an entire show as we've done today. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I love talking with you, man. <laughs> Uh, I'll be happy to come back on, on the show. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's good to have two Andrews on the show and get rid of CJ for for this interview for one time. <laughs> well, hey, thanks a lot, Andrew. I really appreciate your time today and uh, uh, sharing all the great goodness with Document DB over the last seven, eight months and six, seven, eight months, something like that. And I'm definitely looking forward to any new things that are coming down the pipe over the next few months. Awesome, yeah. Cool. Thank you. If you have a question for us, Go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a WAV or an MP3 file and provide a link so that we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is an excerpt from Evaporated Eric by Monk Turner used under Creative Commons. You can subscribe to us in iTunes by searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find show notes of each episode. You can find us on Facebook searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.